everyone. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I'm your host, Ari Witten, and today I have with me a special guest, Michael McAvoy, who is someone whose work I followed for a long time and whose work I really admire and have wanted to have on this podcast for a very long time. So uh, welcome, Michael. And actually, before I officially welcome you, let me read your bio. Um, you are the Michael McAvoy is the founder of Metabolic Healing. He's been involved in clinical practice since 2007. In addition to functioning as a clinician and writer, he's a teacher, educator, and systems creator of diverse health-related and functional medicine curriculum and modalities. And I, I have to say on a personal note, I know a number of our colleagues have gone through uh, his courses and have, have just said that they're kind of like top-notch. They're the best things out there. So it's on my agenda to go through uh, your courses as well. Uh, so welcome, Michael. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Ari. It's good to be here. Yeah. So I saw you uh, in the recent documentary also that we were both featured in, the Human Longevity Project. And um, I have to say that you were my, you and, and Dr. Ted Achikoso were my two favorites. Those were the people where I was like, yes, these guys are <laughs> awesome. These guys get it. Um, so it's, it's great to connect with you. And uh, I know we have a number of common interests but uh, I, I know that we also have a number of areas where, um, where we have also very different interests and that you've gone very deep on some, some very cool topics that uh, I haven't. And so I'm, I'm really excited to uh, hear about that and talk to you about some of these areas that you've been exploring. So one of the, um, the ideas that was presented by our mutual friend, Jason Prawl, uh, when we kind of, when I threw out the idea to have you on the podcast was... Uh, for us to talk about the extracellular environment. And um, this is something that's really not a common thing for people to talk about in the health realm. This is like, I mean, almost nobody's talking about this. And there was a, a quote that I read in one of your articles on the subject where you quoted, um, I forget the, guy, the person's name, but I have the quote here. I think it's Alfred Pissinger. Yes, yeah. I think that's the one. And the quote says, Western physiology has the habit of reducing the function of the cell to an incomprehensible maze of cellular biology. This has led to the discovery of elaborate biochemistry pathways, as well as extraordinary study of the human genome. With these intricate studies, the extracellular environment has largely been neglected. Yet, the extracellular environment plays a vital governing and inseparable role in the function of the cell. So with that in mind, I would love for you to give kind of an overview of what the extracellular environment is, because a lot of people listening probably have never even heard that term and have no idea what the hell that even means. So uh, I know there's a lot of angles to this and a lot of different aspects to this extracellular environment, so we can kind of approach it from, from different aspects, but can you give kind of a broad overview of what that even means, this, this term extracellular environment? I'll start out by saying that I'm still learning what the extracellular matrix is. Mm -hmm. And um, the deeper that I go into researching the extracellular matrix, the more I realize that so much has been lost and so much has, is yet to be discovered. Um, I'm now kind of at a point where I'm looking at the influence of physics and uh, cell membrane electrophysiology and even water research and how all of these things are affecting the environment that cells live in. So we know that we're comprised largely of cells. And now that, that quote you read, I think that was actually something that I had just blurbed out. Oh, but maybe, maybe that's why <laughs> it was a, there was a Pissinger quote in there and the, the Pissinger quote, I'll yes. say, I'll just, I'll paraphrase that. So Pissinger was a German uh, doctor, researcher, um, who had really kind of has been seen as one of the pioneers of extracellular matrix therapeutics, extracellular matrix research. And Pissinger, the opening statement of his book is related to how the concept of a cell, when it is isolated from its environment, is a morphological abstraction. Mm -hmm. And that is the opening statement of this really profound book um, called Matrix and Matrix Regulation by Alfred Pissinger. And so as you get into this stuff, you start to realize that we have spent a, tr a tremendous amount of time 
looking at all of the intricate pathways inside of the cell, the genomics, even the mitochondria, cell membrane dynamics, you know, go on and on and on forever about all that stuff. But we have to appreciate that the cell does not exist in an isolated state. Our cells literally are existing in a truly holistic environment with its extracellular space. And that extracellular matrix is comprised of a lot of different things. It's comprised of what is referred to as the matrosome or the basically the network of connective tissue and collagen fibers. But it's also comprised of the lymphatic vessels which run through the connective tissue and all of the tributaries of the lymphatic system. The extracellular matrix also will include in it um, immunological factors. Um, the, for example, mast cells and macrophages are highly concentrated in the extracellular matrix, coordinating different immunological responses. The extracellular matrix is integral to the function and behavior of the cells in, in many different important ways. The extracellular matrix controls the life cycle of the cell, modulates and influences the behavior of the cell, modulates and influences how growth factors are utilized. And that may be one of the most interesting and important parts of matrix function is its ability to regulate growth factors. And we know that there's about 15 to 20 growth factors of the body that are modulated by the extracellular matrix uh, glycoproteins. And so when somebody has, uh, I, I'm interested in the, in the kind of pathophysiology of what goes wrong when uh, disease ensues <clears throat> and particularly interested in certain um, diseases and conditions uh, that involve uh, abnormalities to the extracellular matrix, degradation to the extracellular matrix. And so a lot of the research that I've been doing as of late has been looking at many of the mechanisms that will eventually cause a degradation to the matrix, a breaking down of the matrix, and a consequent subsequent, uh, a subsequent set of different um, processes that ensue that cause a number of different symptoms. And so the more that we can start to understand the significance of the extracellular environment as it relates to the health of the body, the better we'll be able to understand what, in, what we need to be doing proactively as well as therapeutically to treat such individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because uh, I think here in the, in the U.S., we've really focused on what's going on inside of the cell, and it's, it's very, you know, very much about different cellular parts and, uh, and, and genes and, and so on and the biochemistry of that. Uh, but I'm under the impression that there are certain kind of paradigms and, and um, schools of thought in Europe that have become quite popular that are really focused on the extracellular environment, the extracellular matrix. Why do you think that um, that, that that has happened? Why do you think that the U.S. has kind of gone down this pathway of focusing on like just kind of these isolated cells and what's going on inside of them versus this, this environment that surrounds all of our cells? Well, I think that it's a common thing for Western physiology and in, in biology in general to, um, to isolate things and to study things in isolated fragmented forms. And we have many examples of that going back a very, very long time. And it, it, in, in this day and age, the, the, the research is so focused on you know, very small fragmented parts of the human body that we often very, very easily lose sight of the bigger picture. There's many schools uh, of, of thinking in, in Europe, particularly in Germany, that have for many decades now been focused on creating more holistic models of medicine that's based around regulation physiology, that's based around um, concepts of bioenergetics and the effects that these things are having on the extracellular terrain of the body. Um, for example, um, Helmut Schimmel was the first person to actually use the term functional medicine somewhere in the late 90s. And he was influenced by a lot of these 
uh, homotoxicologists that were influenced by people that were studying the extracellular environment and looking for ways to change and influence and impact the health and the physiology of the body by manipulating, by modulating, by attenuating the matrix as a whole. So I think that um, to answer the question, it's, it's a habit of Western sciences, Western biology especially, to become uh, fragmented in such a way where it's easy to overlook um, the forest that you're in and to just focus on the most smallest um, and, and I would argue abstract concepts, but, but really in that process, we lose the greater vision. Hmm. Very interesting. So what, what kinds of things like on a practical level, what kinds of things result from a dysfunctional extracellular environment or maybe another way of phrasing this would be what, uh, what indications are there? What symptoms or, or, or conditions might a person have that indicate that there's something wrong with the extracellular environment? I'll start off by saying that the extracellular matrix, I see it as a meeting place for the entire physiology of the body. A meeting place, a battleground, as well as a protective barrier, as a communicative center, a communicative epicenter, where the immune system, the nervous system, and the endocrine systems all converge and meet to basically create a homeostatic balanced environment. And we have a lot of evidence of this based upon the actual constituents that are present in the matrix. Um, when the matrix becomes dysfunctional, we lose our ability to regulate our neuroendocrine immune system. So we normally think of the nervous system, the, the, the central and autonomic nervous systems and the immune system and the endocrine systems as separate systems, but it's becoming more increasingly obvious that these systems are not in any way separate. They are intricately related to one another and they inter, 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 intimately talk to one another in order to accomplish many of the same goals. The matrix is this place where these three systems can converge, where these three systems can express their functionality and to basically influence Everything from uh, the way we think, our behavior, to the way that our cells function, to the way that oxygen is delivered to the tissues, to the way that our tissues remain hydrated, to the ways in which we're able to, to remove harmful toxins from our cells and our tissues. Um, these are some of the many different functions of an operating matrix. When the matrix becomes compromised, we can, well, let's look at some basic, um, you know, conditions and disease processes that definitively involve uh, degradation to the extracellular matrix. So, for example, autoimmune diseases are a good example of this. And this is especially true of rheumatoid arthritis, as well as in uh, lupus erythematosus. These are connective tissue diseases that have resulted in a variety of different abnormalities. Um, we can think of other types of autoimmune diseases which might involve matrix um, dysregulation. Um, we can think of conditions such as uh, hypermobility, Lyme disease, chronic illness, chronic fatigue syndrome, mold toxicity, or chronic inflammatory response syndrome. All of these things involve on some level a dysfunction or degradation or um, compromise to the extracellular matrix. In, in the example of chronic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS, as it's now become known, we know that one of the initial processes that is involved is, is the, basically the, uh, the infiltration of metalloproteinases, MMP9 specifically, which is essentially bores a hole into the extracellular matrix to begin the degradation of collagen and connective tissue so that the infiltration of, of immune cells and innate immune responders can then penetrate through to the affected area. This incites inflammatory activity. And in the case of SIRS, this inflammatory activity is run amok. So we see this as happening a lot in, in many different conditions. This can be happening in, in environmental toxic exposure, such as in, you know, living in a water damaged building. It can occur in um, Borreliosis or Lyme disease, where we have similar mechanisms that are 
our, our innate immune system is responding and generating inflammation that does not resolve as it needs to. The consequence of this is that when the matrix becomes compromised, we start to see many of the characteristic symptoms of this. So in SIRS, for example, we'll, we'll often see symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. We could see symptoms of pseudo hypoxia or tissue hypoxia where there's a lower oxygen concentration, discoloration of the tips of the fingers or the tips of the toes. This is because one of the, the mechanisms of this is that one of the endothelial growth factors called VEGF has its um, binding sites, activation sites, and maturation sites within different extracellular matrix glycoproteins. And so if those glycoproteins are not being synthesized, are being degraded, then many of these growth factors, including VEGF, TGF beta 1, insulin growth factor 1, can't bind and can't mature properly. Consequence, consequently, we have symptoms that arise. Tissue hypoxia, as I mentioned, peripheral neuropathy is not another possible symptom. Um, loss of cognitive function. Remember that the matrix is, is involved. It, it's, it's everywhere. It's pervasive. It's ubiquitously found in every uh, organ and tissue of the body. So there's many different consequences of this. And as we're starting to learn, and, and really as we start to get deeper and deeper into this science and in this research, we find out that certain individuals are likely have a much higher predisposition to having problems in extracellular matrix function from because of genetic predispositions, for example, um, individuals that have joint hyperlaxity or joint hypermobility, which is very common, um, have at least some degree of extracellular matrix dysfunction. I was told, incidentally, by um, a, a, a doctor who is the head of, of two integrative medicine clinics in California, that 70 to 80 percent of his patients are hypermobile, and he only deals with the sickest of the sick. I've had patients tell me that after their illness had ensued, uh, that they became hypermobile, that suddenly their skin became hyperelastic, or their elbows and shoulders and wrists and fingers became more, became more hyperextensible as a result of their chronic illness. The, the reason for this is because in these types of chronic illnesses, they, uh, the, the extracellular matrix has been degraded to an extent where the collagen and the ability to synthesize collagen has been impaired. Mm. Fascinating. So um, you mentioned there are certain genetic conditions where a person might have a proneness to um, extracellular matrix dysfunction. In, in that kind of vein, I'm wondering what the, the, the level of evidence is or what the kind of layers of evidence are that allow us to discern whether extracellular matrix dysfunction is a cause or a consequence of or just a, a, a co-occurring phenomenon um, in a lot of these diseases. Is there evidence of any kind that we can look to that says this dysfunction at the, at the level of the extracellular matrix is clearly a, a cause or a contributing factor to this condition or to this symptom? Well, so for example, there's, there's a number of different, you know, so-called uh, genetic diseases which involve uh, collagen deficiency of various kinds. So Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, for example, or EDS, is probably the most common. Then you have Marfan syndrome, which is very similar. And then you've got some even very rare genetic uh, conditions that are, are similar in, in, in that certain types of collagen aren't being made. A genetic disease is different from, from uh, you know, these genetic singular nucleotide polymorphisms that you hear all about, you know, MTHFR and you know, APOE4 and all these things. Um, not to minimize those, but, but a genetic, um, a true genetic mutation, as we'll really call it, is essentially um, when you have an, a knockout of a gene to where the, 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 the end gene product, the protein or the enzyme that gets made is, is, is basically, it's not there. And so um, this is referred to often as haploinsufficiency, when, when a gene product is so uh, mutated from, from, from genetic defect that the, the functional enzyme doesn't get made sufficiently. So these are happening in, in true clinically diagnosed Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Marfan syndrome. But we now know based upon, um, we now know based upon some of the more recent research that 
the, the classification of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which by itself is often ch changing. There used to be 13 different types. Now I think there's only 11. And so they argue which is which. Um, but we now know that some of the, the newer science that's come out, like the, the, the research from Chen and Morissette in 2016 showed that individuals could have uh, coexisting congenital adrenal hyperplasia with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And previously, that just wasn't conceivably, that wasn't possible. That we would, there's no way that that could be possible um, from, from a genetic standpoint, but we now know that that is possible. And so it calls into question whether or not haploinsufficiency of a gene is even necessary to, ma it doesn't even matter. It may not even matter. I don't think that it does because I, I've witnessed um, many different individuals with, with severe joint hypermobility that were not diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, yet they have the same symptom profile and illness profile of somebody that does. Hmm. And so what, is, other, what does that symptom profile look like, just out of curiosity? Well, the symptom profile of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome usually involves far more than hyperlaxity of the joints. And it, it involves usually a... Uh, a complex dysregulation of, of multi-system atrophy, multi-system um, uh, co comorbidities. Comorbidities meaning multi-symptom, multi-disease, multi-everything multi going on. A common, co very common uh, symptoms in EDS and in individuals that think they have or might have EDS include um, some of the stuff that I've already mentioned, such as the, the, the tissue hypoxia, extremely weak, um, extremities are extremely weak muscle tone, muscle function, motor function has been reduced. Um, oxygen saturation of the tissues may be lower. Individuals may suffer from um, postural orthostatic tachycardia. They may suffer from mast cell activation disorder. They may suffer from uh, chronic fatigue or been diagnosed with CFS-ME. They may have um, autoimmune disease. They may have lupus or RA or even history of that in the family. They may have C as I mentioned, CH, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. They might have um, problems with blood clotting, which is rampant in the EDS community. They might have endometriosis or PCOS, very common among individuals with hypermobility. These are, these are very common things that you start to see coexisting with this, this disease phenotype. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what I've been doing over the past 14, 16 months is really looking at why and, and what, what are the best theories that could possibly explain these coexisting morbidities? And so we can, we can have more detailed discussions about what some of those theories are, but, but in, in actuality, it, they, all, they all share one common theme, is extracellular matrix dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And as you begin to look at the function of what the extracellular matrix is doing, the growth factors that it regulates, the ability for, um, so for example, one of the largest concentrations of mast cells, which are basically um, a type of immune cell um, that release histamine as well as other chemical mediators, um, these, uh, these mast cells are found in extraordinarily high concentrations in, in the connective tissue in the extracellular matrix. And the, the, there's actually, they have a dual function. So we, a lot of us hear about mast cell activation disorder, mast cell activation syndrome, of which there's just, you know, chronic um, histamine intolerance. And, it, you know, histamine intolerance eventually became MCAS, you know, in a very short period of time. Now people are calling it MCAS. It's no longer histamine intolerance. So, um, but, but the, the point is, is that these mast cells have dual functions. They don't only degrade and release histamine and serotonin and other mediators. They are also part of the regenerating and rebuilding phase of the matrix. But the mast cells are in a communicative kind of crosstalk with um, the, the cells that produce the, 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 the extracellular matrix constituents called the fibroblasts. You can think of the fibroblast cells as spiders. I like to think of them as spiders. And the matrix is the web that gets spun out from these fibroblasts. And so when you have, when you have matrix dysregulation, when you have mast cell activation disorder, you have some type of matrix involvement that's going on. You have something that's, that's, that's taking place that's causing these mast cells to shift from a balanced state 
or a state of, of, of repair and regeneration to de degranulation and degradation. So we have to look at more causal factors. We know that toxins, environmental toxins, can play a tremendous role in matrix dysregulation because of the fact that the glycosaminoglycans, and forgive me for keep just rambling on, but the, the glycosaminoglycans, which are one of the major constituents of the matrix, of the extracellular matrix, they're, they're often referred to as GAGs. The GAGs are negatively charged. They have sulfated, they're sulfated. And so a, a negatively charged anion is going to attract positively charged cations. And so it's been, it's been speculated for decades that positively charged trivalent cationic metals like aluminum and mercury and cadmium, aluminum having a triple valent plus charge, are going to bond to the, to the sulfate tails of the extracellular matrix glycosamine glycans, causing potential autoimmune and or immunological and or inflammatory and aid immune responding kinds of effects. So Stephanie Seneff, the MIT scientist who's done a tremendous amount of research publishing with uh, Hansel was speculating based upon the, the, the overwhelming amount of evidence that the, 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 the Monsanto chemical glyphosate from the Roundup chemical is largely causing, um, is being replaced, uh, gl the glycine in the connective tissue is being replaced by glyphosate, which is, they're very, very similar in structure. And, uh, you know, then her, all of her research kind of goes deeper into investigating these possible autoimmune uh, effects because the metalloproteinases in the matrix can't break down the glyphosate pro, uh, uh, protein link bonds. And so you've got all kinds of different problems going on. You know, so, this, this interview is going like, there were, there were like three moments during that time that you were talking where I was about to ask you a question and then I didn't ask you the question and you actually started talking about the very thing that I was going to ask you about. So, um, uh, you know, I, let's, let's go a little deeper into this because there's a couple things that tie into what you're talking about. One is uh, Robert Navio's work. Uh, and I know that you've written a bit about the cell danger response, pure energetic signaling and how that relates to the mast cells that you were just referring to. Um, and then Stephanie Seneff's work around the glycosaminoglycans and, uh, and glyphosate and that sort of stuff. So um, I'll, you kind of already started talking about Stephanie Seneff, so maybe go a little deeper in that, and then we can uh, talk, talk about Navio's work a little bit. So glycine is probably the simplest and most used amino acid in the human body, and it's integral in our DNA synthesis processes. It's integral in so many different mechanisms it's really difficult to talk about what glycine is not being involved in. Glycine is one of the, the amino acids that's used in the synthesis of, of glutathione, which is our most ubiquitous intracellular antioxidant system. It's, it's, uh, but, the, but I should say that the highest concentration of glycine in the human body is in connective tissue, which is, which is the extracellular matrix. And so Stephanie Seneff postulated in the paper a couple years ago that the, the chemical glyphosate is likely um, being substituted for glycine in the connective tissue. And so obviously the problem here is that glyphosate is, is very toxic. There's been dozens of studies published around the world that have speculated that glyphosate is a probable carcinogen. It's a probable neurotoxin. It probably causes gastrointestinal dysregulation. It might be strongly ideological with celiac disease because they seem to, the celiac disease seems to have the same or very similar ideology to the, to the effects that glyphosate toxicity has on the gut. So that research is profoundly significant because glyphos glyphosate is ubiquitously found in the environment now. It's very difficult to avoid it, even if you eat all organic foods, it's everywhere. And it's a major problem. And some researchers even speculate that it's um, one of the core problems in neurodegenerative diseases, especially in, in some like autism. That's other kind of doctors and scientists talk about that kind of stuff. So clearly, uh, the environment that we live in, which is which has become increasingly more challenged with toxins of various kinds, um, is going to challenge our ability to, to have a proper functioning extracellular matrix. Consequently, if the matrix is being compromised, our immune system is going to become overreactive and the function of our cells is going to be impaired in many different ways. Mm. 
Beautiful. So, so let's talk about how Robert Navio's work ties into all of this now. Um, and he's, you know, I think most of my listeners are probably familiar with hearing me talk about the cell danger response to some degree, but probably a, a little refresher would, would be great for, for a lot of people. So the cell danger response is a very fascinating and important concept. And, and I would argue one of the most important evolving bits of scientific research that's been happening over the last several years. And it actually came out of the earlier research that had been going on since the mid nineties and the late nineties, when they began to identify what are called, what are now being known as damage associated molecular patterns and pathogen associated molecular patterns. And then, you know, you've got other things going on like long interspersed nuclear elements and, and these, and uh, heat shock proteins and different, proteins that modulate the opening and closing of the mitochondrial membrane. And, and so all of this research is basically pointing to a highly conserved, ancient evolutionary process that is built into the symbiotic cells, which I'm referring to our cells as symbionts, th these highly conserved evolutionary processes that are integral in the protection against perceived threat before the adaptive and even before the innate immune system is, res is responding to threat, the cells and particularly the signals that are occurring within the mitochondria are sensing that there has been a threat to the, the particular cell in question. And so consequently, as a result of this, this highly complex uh, conserved danger system that's in built into the cells, we have a series of events that takes place that alters the metabolism of the cell, changes, down regulates from fourth gear to second gear, shuts the, 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 the methylation down, shuts down the, the consumption of energy of, of ATP. And now we have a coordinated defense program that's now being initiated by the mitochondria and this becomes a coordination. So the ATP gets ejected out of the cell into the extracellular, pericellular, extracellular environment, leading to a number of additional processes, including the recruitment of the innate immune system. So basically what Dr. Navio has done is he's, he's synthesized a lot of these important concepts and he's expounded on them by conducting further research using his blood metabolomics profile, first in, in mice and then in, in, in a small set of humans, to basically try to plot out you know, 500 blood metabolites to find out and understand how cells tend to behave and what pathways are involved and what basically is going on. And what Navio and his team found was that the, or they, well, I should say, they postulated and discovered is that the purinergic receptors and the purinergic signaling, which is all this extracellular nucleotides, ATP, but also ADP, UDP, these other pur purines get thrown out of the cell and the paracellular extracellular environment and begin coordinating different inflammatory events. But these extracellular nucleotides then will bind to um, they, will, they can then bind to different purinergic receptors and, and essentially perpetuate the cell danger response. Well, so it turns out that, um, this, that these purinergic receptors are, the activation of the binding of these purinergic receptors is a, this is, this is one of the most common, uh, this is the most common um, receptor type in the human physiology. Purine, purinergic receptors are abundant in every tissue type and, and virtually, I believe virtually every cell type, maybe every cell type, including the central nervous system. They're essential for, for development and for neural development and for growth and maturation. They bind to, and they, with their activation in certain cell types activates the mTOR um, system, which is the, the anabolic growth process. So we clearly must have purinergic signaling in order to coordinate growth processes. However, it's become clear that the, this danger signaling is highly relying on purinergic signaling and certain purine receptors like the P2X and the P2Y receptors to perpetuate this cell danger signaling. Now that's a good thing 
because this means that our cells have evolved to protect themselves and have a highly evolved complex set of coordinated events to, to basically make sure that that happens. The problem is that for some people, this, um, this process of cell danger signaling does not recede and it perpetuates and results in or contributes greatly to a, a disease process. Right, and, and to phrase that a little differently, it, it's meant to turn on transiently in the context of some kind of clear threat, whether um, a toxic exposure or uh, an infection or, or a trauma or something like that, and then it's meant to recede and go away. But in some people, it seems to stay switched on, basically. Absolutely, good. That's, you just nailed it. So we have to have it, we need to have it, and for most of us, it recedes, in chronic illness, it doesn't recede. It stays on all the time. Now, it could stay on all the time. You could have many kind of discussions about why that is. And we don't exactly know yet the, the more intricate mechanisms of what is causing that continual perpetuation. We know that per Navio's research, that the purinergic receptor activity is perpetuating to an extent, but we suspect that it all comes back to the mitochondria because the mitochondria are, core, are, are highly involved in coordinating this, these series of events. When we think of the mitochondria as only producing ATP, but we now know that that's only a partial truth. We know that the mitochondria are highly sensitive to, to they, they're highly sensitive to light and to electrochemical energy and to photons. We know that the ATP are uh, integral in this damage associated molecular pattern signaling in the cell danger response. So the more we learn about what the mitochondria really are doing, and I believe that has to go back to evolutionary biology um, to look at the origins of how that symbiosis event originally occurred. I think that a lot of it's going to come back to, to understanding how a proteobacteria uh, uh, invaded our cells and became the, the main workers and coordinators of, of, of the interesting things that happen. Um, so I think it's going to come down to, to our, under, our better understanding of microbes, bacteria, and the origins of how the mitochondria suddenly invaded our cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. So uh, this whole cell danger response, how does that tie into um, the extracellular matrix and, and also to mast cells specifically? So the extracellular matrix um, part of these, the damage associated molecular pattern process involves the breakdown of hyaluronic acid. Hyaluronic acid is one of the glycosaminoglycans, one of the four major glycosaminoglycans that um, provide a number of important functions. For example, hyaluronic acid in its normal state is integral for the hydration of the tissue. It, it helps to draw water or biological electrolyte um, solution to the, the connective tissue. Hyaluronic acid also provides a certain degree of stability and uh, stabilization to the connective tensile strength, just like the other glycosaminoglycans do. It probably is involved in electrochemical communication through ion, uh, graded ion and water balance mechanisms. But we know that when, high, when there's a cell danger or damage associated molecular patterns process going on, this leads this can this leads to the breakdown of hyaluronic acid and those hyaluronic acid fragments are then basically damps they're damage associated molecular protein fragments that are now being recognized as by the uh, the, the metalloproteinases to come and take down the rest of the ship come and take break down the matrix further bore further holes into the process so that the immune cells can penetrate so that's one that's one way in which the extracellular matrix is uh, uh, affected by the cell danger response, but there's many, many others. Um, so for example, when in the cell, one of the processes of the cell danger response involves the, the, the transitioning of, of vitamin D, calcitriol, into an inactive metabolite. This is gonna have a direct effect on collagen synthesis in the fibroblasts, as well as in the, the change in hormonal synthesis. Um, in terms of how mast cells are affected, remember that mast cells are, are right there in the extracellular matrix in the connective tissue, and that when 
when purine when these purines and these extra ATP binds to the receptor of the mast cell, it causes these mast cells to basically burst, degranulate, and release histamine. And so you become highly symptomatic. Um, but we know that we know that again. I want to kind of bring it back because I don't want to just talk about these things in a, a, a kind of a localized context. Even though we, these these little things are happening, this is that that the matrix itself. And this is something that Pissinger identified with his series of, you know, electrodermal tests and uh, basically looking at, at how reflex arcs work with the brain and the connective tissue. We know that the matrix is a communication center. It, it, it is of itself a highly intelligent network of tissue and cells that when one part of the matrix is affected, the entire matrix is aware of the threat. And that is something that Pissinger demonstrated repeatedly in the 1960s, 70s, and probably up until the 80s and 90s, is that the matrix is in itself an entire organism or entire organ system that is in a communication with itself and with the associated organs. So when you have matrix dysregulation, it has a systemic effect, not necessarily just a localized effect. When your mast cells are degranulating in your forearm and you're itching mad, like mad, that is having a direct effect on receptors in the brain. That is having a direct effect on the hypothalamus and the HPT axis and the ability for certain hormones to be released. We know that the release of cortisol is going to have an effect on the matrix. We know that the release of estrogen and progesterone are also going to have an effect on the matrix. Different concentration gradients are going to have an effect on the matrix. The status of a person's hydration is going to affect the matrix. The exposure of different light is known to affect the matrix. We know that sunlight in, and we know that near infrared light increases collagen synthesis. We know that near infrared light, near infrared light attracts water to the connective tissue. We know that the extracellular matrix is very similar in its effects. So if you look at the matrosome, if you look at the the the, the tunnel-like structures that the, the 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 extracellular substance is comprised of. It's remarkably similar to Dr. Gerald Pollack's description of exclusion zone water, mm -hmm. in which you have these lipophilic tubules that are ejecting protons and are creating a highly negative charge to maintain this water fluid concentration gradient and hydration gradient. That's happening in the extracellular matrix, and all the work in the 80s and 90s showed that, even before Pollack. So we know that we're, what, we're, what we're after here is a truly more holistic way of understanding pathology, of understanding physiology and how really the, the, the matrix is an organ. I don't know if anyone realizes this, is, real, realizes this, but the interstitium was just recognized as an organ system just yeah. two years ago. Well, the interstitium is a system, is, is a, basically a bunch of spaces filled inside of the extracellular matrix. <laughs> part of the extracellular matrix. I would argue that the organ system is everything that's around uh, the, the, the uh, interstitium. But the interstitium has these polysaccharides and gel-like polysaccharides and proteins. Well, polysaccharides are the basic substrate or the, the source of, of, of all these glycosaminoglycans glycans that make up the collagen and the connective tissue. Yeah, fascinating stuff. And again, I was just about to ask you about the interstitium and this kind of new discovery that we're seeing headlines in the media about, and you brought that up again. Well, I mean, it's kind of absurd in a sense. I'll just comment on that because yeah. in, 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 in the oldest systems of medicine on this planet, including Chinese medicine, if you read the, the, the Nen Qing, which is one of the oldest, uh, Nei Jing, which is one of the oldest Chinese medicine texts, they talk about the triple burner, which are the, the, the triple heater, um, San Zhao Meridian, San Zhao Channel, as being the organ that, that includes everything but has no form. And so a lot of the, a lot of the, the really innovative uh, uh, acupuncture thinkers like Dr. Daniel Keown, for example, somebody that I really follow, who's basically flipping physiology upside down and saying, and he's a trained medical doctor, looking at the, what the Chinese were aware of thousands of years ago, he's saying, and, and I agree with him, that the interstitium is the triple burner. Mm. So there, there's, there's this, this remarkable relationship between these ancient systems. And in fact, one of Pissinger's, one of Pissinger's main research projects was the use of acupuncture and the effect that that's having on matrix function. And he was able to demonstrate clearly how the insertion of a single acupuncture needle 
into connective tissue, cause what he calls leukocytolysis or the breakdown of billions of white blood cells. Instantaneously, they begin to degrade, releasing all kinds of chemicals and, and essentially creating a communication, a uh, broadband communication from the site of injection to, to, the, to, the, to the distant parts of the matrix. Yeah, I'm glad you brought this up. There's, there's a couple things here. Um, I, and I wanna kind of take this practical now and talk about some of the big factors that disrupt matrix functioning. You've already alluded to some of them and then also talk about some of the, the strategies to build up uh, the health of the matrix. And acupuncture is, is potentially one of those. Um, a couple things here. One is there seems to be some positive research on acupuncture. Uh, and there also seems to be some research saying, hey, it's no better than placebo effect. So that's kind of one thing that I was hoping to get your take on is why there seems to be so much research that doesn't really show profound effects. Um, but the other thing is, in Western scientific terms, most people can't really explain what acupuncture is doing. I mean, it's, we kind of have the, the kind of the Chinese medical explanation of it as it's affecting certain meridian pathways, but in Western medical science, those meridian pathways aren't recognized. So it's kind of this weird thing where they're like, well, we can't really explain what's going on in Western medical science terms. Um, I disagree that, that, that if you look at embryology, you can clearly explain how acupuncture is working. And that's something that Dr. Daniel Keene has done better than anybody else that I know. Okay, so um, please. Em, em, please. So, embryo, so if you look at how organ systems are formed from a, base, from, from a base template of the embryo, for example, we begin to see that the, the, the channels in the, in the Chinese medical context, the acupuncture context, are basically a representation of fascia and connective tissue that have formed as a result of embryology. And so the work is, of Keon and his teachers have identified this and, I, and in my opinion, and I'm not a Chinese medical practitioner, but I have kind of dabbled in, in some of the research. Um, when, you, when, you start, when you look at the acupuncture system from an embryological standpoint and from the, the standpoint of fascia and how fascia um, and embryology are, are inter, intimately connected from the, the earliest stage of embryological development when we were just a, a template on a, on a blank slate and that template began to grow slowly. The organ, the liver, for example, would, would grow in and become the, the liver channel. The, the kidney meridian would grow out of the similar, out of the similar context. The, the, for example, the, uh, the other example, the, the large intestine, the channels in the arms would grow out of um, where the, the large intestine was. And so you have this outward growth in embryology, which if you look at the channels, it clearly, uh, in my opinion, it clearly elucidates how the system actually works. So I think that a lot of the research that has been done in acupuncture is, is first of all, it's looking at using certain acupuncture points from the traditional Chinese system, which were actually more or less, that's like the post Maoist acupuncture that came post-1972 when, when Nixon administration went to China and, you know, they, they witnessed people, they witnessed the, the open heart surgery using needles and a local anesthetic with the chest cavity wide open. How the hell is that possible? Um, but that, as a result of that, Chinese medicine evolved to the United States and it's, it was basically post-Maoist. But, but aside from that, you have all of these other existing um, acupuncture systems, like the tongue and the tongue systems, for example, that were based not on single points, but on channel theory, right? And so there's kind of these, these other schools that never really got press that had been used in China for thousands of years. Um, so a lot of the research. There also seems to be some other schools, like there's Japanese texts on acupuncture that seem to operate based on different points. And I've seen practitioners who are Chinese acupuncturists and Japanese acupuncturists, and they kind of they, they both imagine or, or they both kind of will tell you that what they're doing is superior to what the other person was doing. Right. So I mean, any system, you know, eventually becomes you know dogmatic in a certain sense. Um, to me, the basic, the basic research on where acupuncture should be going 
uh, in the future. I'm talking about from a, a, a understanding it from a more of a physiology perspective, I think has to turn to embryology. Mm -hmm. And when you start looking at it from that perspective, you start to understand how the Chinese were able to make sense of it. So I'd recommend checking out Dr. Daniel Keown for that. For sure. Is, is he in Florida, by the way? No, he's in uh, the UK. He's in London. Oh, okay. I'm thinking of another acupuncturist, Dr. Daniel something. Um, okay, so acupuncture uh, being something that can potentially benefit matrix functioning. Uh, what are some of the other big factors that damage matrix functioning? And what are some of the big factors that, um, that people can maybe think about implementing to benefit the health of their extracellular matrix? So I know a that's a very broad question, but. Yeah, so as a, as a clinician that uh, is, I, I'm, I'm very interested in trying to figure out how things work. And, and um, when things don't work, I'm, I get even more interested in why things don't work. Um, and, and I'm interested in, in what causes complex illness. Um, I'm interested in understanding the mechanisms of, you know, the, the health issues of my clients um, and, and really trying to understand those on a much deeper level. And that's basically how I, I am. Um, so a lot of the research that I've done has kind of been around understanding how certain individuals are more predisposed to illness um, and, and certain illnesses especially. So as it came to my realization that people that have even mild joint hypermobility often have um, many different complex health issues, not always, because there's always outliers, you know, but are, are often very prone and susceptible to different types of illness. There's a phenotype that arises as a result of that. And, and again, it, it comes back to the co collagen synthesis component, but it comes, it also involves, you know, the understanding the, the complex interactions of how the connective tissue is, um, uh, is involved with the nervous system, the immune system, and the endocrine system through different feedback loops and things like this. So individuals that, uh, I mean, this is one phenotype that I've been looking at is people that have hypermobility, even mild hypermobility, and trying to source out who in my client population has that going on. And can I find any links to that hypermobility and any of the symptoms and conditions that they may be dealing with? And I found a lot of correlation to that. And since having really delved into this, I've developed various therapeutic approaches, which fortunately has seemed to work for a, a, some percentage of these clients, not everyone, but a pretty substantial percent. And so I'm continuously evolving my understanding of how to develop more integrative therapies that for, for these people that have suspected matrix dysfunction. It doesn't necessarily only involve people with hypermobility, however, because the extra, but, and I just to that point, I'll say that because hypermobility involves defects in collagen synthesis or decorin synthesis or different, you know, things that should be uh, uh, integral to the function of the matrix, because that's happening, at least to some extent, it, it's something that I'm looking at. But clearly, anybody can, can suffer from matrix dysregulation. Um, in chronic illness especially, you see this phenotype a lot. You see a lot of these same kinds of conditions, mast cell disorder, you see POTS. And when you start to see these things in clusters, you start to see um, co correlation. So part of the research I started doing last year was on this gene cluster on chromosome 6. This is a whole other discussion. But trying to suss out that phenotype through just identifying patterns and recognizing symptoms that they might have has led me to a deeper understanding and appreciation of what types of therapies could be useful for these people. And so I think I've hit on some important key points. A lot of this is not my research. I have to credit people like um, Deborah Cusack for developing the, the Cusack protocol for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is definitely a very good starting point for people that have hypermobility. Polysaccharides have a, 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 a role to play for sure in regulating the matrix function. Um, it really depends on the, on the situation. You know, I've used, I've seen other things going on with, with some of these people that have kind of this hypoxia issue. I suspect that um, 
there's problems with the cytochrome systems in some cases. Um, there might be porphyria or porphyria that's going on um, in, some, in some cases, which is basically a condition, the secondary porphyria, which is a problem in synthesizing HAME. So there could be cytochrome dysregulation um, suspected, um, postural orthostatic tachycardia, there could be salt wasting. I think that RCCX, which is this cluster of genes on chromosome six, is probably strongly ideological in, in, in some of these people. Um, I have theories about why that is, but we can use different therapeutic modalities. We can use stuff just as simple as um, non-psychoactive cannabis, CBD oil, for example, to help regulate um, stress response as well as promoting GABAergic signaling, um, to turn off the fight or flight response. CBD has been very useful to me, especially with, with these people that have this phenotype of matrix dysregulation. Um, it, it seems to act in similar ways to like low dose naltrexone, which other people in, in these different circles um, seem to, to be using with, with some degree of, of, of effect. So it can modulate the pain response and pain receptors and things like this. Um, we, we can use other things too. We can use um, a sodium ascorbate, which I, is a form of vitamin C, but I, I know that there's not a lot of research showing the difference between using sodium ascorbate versus, you know, ascorbic acid or calcium ascorbate, but I, I, I think there probably is some, there is a difference in, in their effect, but anyhow, um, vitamin C is, is integral in the, in the function of the matrix. In the extracellular matrix, ascorbate plays an important role as an antioxidant in the endothelium especially. And so when you have scurvy, for example, that is a, basically as a result of collagen breakdown. So we need copper. Copper and vitamin C are integral to the, the processes of collagen synthesis. There's a form of EDS, Ehlers-Danlos, that's basically a lysyl oxidase deficiency which is a transport protein for copper in the connective tissue. I've observed in other people with, with um, hypermobility that there's indications to me of low copper, um, either low serum or plasma copper or low VEGF, or I've seen how um, taking supplemental copper in higher amounts can actually have um, benefit to, to the regulation of some of these functions that are often aberrant. So, you know, there's different ways of, of modulating. I, you know, there's, there's other things that, that seem to show up too. Like the orthostatic tachycardia is difficult. Mast cell stuff is really difficult to treat effectively. Um, but it, it can correct by, uh, you know, by using certain therapies. Like I, I do use infrared sauna. I do find that that has benefit that light therapy can correct matrix dysregulation. The thing that we need to really address, I think, is the toxicity factor. Because a lot of people that are having matrix dysregulation are, are probably very prone and susceptible to different environmental toxins. But those positively charged metals are probably binding to, you know, the negatively charged groups, just, just as we suspect, you know. I mean, again, this stuff needs to be really looked at more intensively in research. Um, but a lot of the early Germans tried to use different systems of, of medicine to create a, a more holistic way of supporting the function of the matrix. We know that we can support the lymphatic fluid. You know, consider that the lymphatic system is a neglected part of human physiology. You know, try and look for, for the, the, uh, the lymphatic system in a basic physiology textbook. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to find much. But yeah. no, you know, no nutrition gets to the cell without the lymphatic system. It's the transport system as well as a battleground for the immune system. And the, the maturation of our dendritic cells and our T cells is largely dependent upon what's going on in the, the, you know, the, the lymphatic fluids. And the lymphatic fluids run through the connective tissue. And so uh, there's crosstalk that's happening between all of these systems. We can use things like lymphatic drainage massage. We could use... Uh, different ways to stimulate the lymphatic system, um, jumping on a trampoline, doing exercise, a sauna therapy to mobilize, uh, to, to mobilize the lymphatic system, muscular contraction um, to do that. So we, we need to really approach 
matrix dysregulation from a holistic viewpoint while taking into account the, um, the problems that each individual is presenting with. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned toxins being a big factor. Uh, some of the most beneficial things, sauna, light exposure, near infrared light, big fan of that. Um, and I know you're presenting a holistic view and I'm kind of doing this very myopic reductionist take on it to try to summarize this, but um, to, to just kind of list off some of the most beneficial therapies that you found, uh, are there any other things worth, worth mentioning here? Well, again, I think that we have to recognize the factors that are causing matrix dysregulation. So if it's mold, we have to address that. If somebody's living in a water damaged building and they're highly susceptible to that, their matrix is being bored. Their metalloproteinase 9, they can test the MMP9 level. And if it's elevated, it's suggesting that the matrix is being degraded because that's the main metalloproteinase that's breaking it down. Mm -hmm. So we have to first understand what is the cause of the matrix dysregulation. Um, uh, if a person's taking a, a, a Cipro, for example, or any of the fluoroquinolone antibiotics, they act by degrading uh, matrix, matrix proteins. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of different variables. So we, instead of throwing a boatload of supplements at somebody, we need to first address what's going on on an individual basis that's causing this problem to begin with. Yeah. At, least, at least develop some educated clinical hypothesis about it. I mean, you know, the thing with clinical hypotheses is that you're, you're, you're not going to be right 100% of the time. You'll be, you'll be right maybe 20 to 30% of the time but maybe something that you've recommended has made an impact. And if you're close, then hopefully that's that you're, you know, you're getting closer. Yeah. So supporting matrix, basic matrix function. So um, marine red algae has been shown in some research to inhibit metalloproteinase nine um, uh, to, to increase collagen synthesis. I've witnessed that indivi uh, I, an individual with Crohn's disease, for example, um, had joint hypermobility in his, in his distal fingers to, that, that where he's almost able to touch his forearms, the tips of his fingers, and, uh, you know, high levels of C-reactive protein. He began taking a, a regimen of um, sulfated polysaccharides from, from, from marine red algae um, and some uh, increased the dosage of vitamin C. And within about 10 to 14 days, he became 30% less hypermobile in his finger joints and all of these inflammatory markers, a C-reactive protein at one point was over 200, and it completely normalized. Wow. So there's something to it, <clears throat> and there's, there's evidence that, it's, that, that these therapies are having an effect. And, you know, it's obviously going to take a long time before the research catch up, catches up to it if it's ever done. There is some research that's been done, but anyway, I don't, I don't anticipate anybody doing wide, widespread clinical trials on this. And the, the reason why this stuff is very difficult is that there's not a lot of clinical tests that you can really about to use to evaluate the function of the extracellular matrix. There's a few, but you know, MMP9, maybe TGF beta, but that's nonspecific. You know, th there's not a lot. It's a dynamic. The, the matrix is a dynamic moving living thing that is constantly breaking down and being regenerated. And that biorhythm is going to change, you know, so, being able to look at these things from, we need new systems for being able to look at this stuff. We can't use these antiquated old systems. One of the problems I have with scientific research is that they study one disease or one condition and one variable. And, but the reality is that the chronic illness is not multi, there's no such thing as a single cause of a single disease. And furthermore, these people that we see with complex illness, they have multiple symptoms across multiple system atrophy going on. Mm -hmm. How are you going to study that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like Dale Bredesen's study with Alzheimer's was, was rejected because it was too complicated. Right. He's trying to study 140 different factors in Alzheimer's disease. But meanwhile, here's your, here's your drug to treat acetylcholinesterase. Forget <laughs> it. It's not working. You yeah. need to develop more complex models for addressing complex illness. Otherwise, it's failure. It'll never, you'll ne medicine will never evolve. 
100%. So uh, I know that we had in mind to cover uh, some of Heinrich Kramer's work as well. And uh, there was a few other topics we wanted to cover, but we've already gone over like uh, an hour and a half. And I, I want to be sensitive to your time here. Um, but maybe we'll have to do a part two of this podcast. And I'd love to have you on again. And um, Michael, thank you so much for doing this. This has been a pleasure. And I think that uh, listeners are really going to enjoy hearing this very novel, non-typical conversation about uh, some of the factors that are affecting their health that are going on outside of their cells. So this has been fascinating uh, for my own edification as well. Uh, so thank you so much. It's, it's really been a pleasure to have you on and I look forward to part two. Thanks, Ari, for having me. Yeah.